Hi, I'm Darlene Carmen, and welcome to the show. Angela Madsen dreams big. She sets adventurous goals for herself and does not allow the fact that she is a paraplegic get in her way. She is the first paraplegic woman to row across the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. She is a four-time World Championship gold medalist with the U.S. rowing team. Angela is here to talk more about these and some of her other amazing feats. Her book is Rowing Against the Wind. Hey, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. That was a, a bit of a drive for you. Thank you for the drive at Long Beach. So 300 and... 367 miles, uh, but you know. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, now you've always been attracted to both sports and the military and uh, several of the members in your family are in the service. And so it was kind of a natural thing for you to join the Marines. And it was during the Marines that you had your first back injury. So what happened? That's true. Um, actually, I had picked the Marine Corps because my brothers who were Marines told me I'd never make it. So I had to go. <laughs> that was just it right there. Um, but when I was in the Marine Corps, I, I played for my military base and I got selected to play for the Women's All Marine Corps basketball team. So I was actually ordered on orders to play basketball for the Marine Corps, mm. which was really exciting, you know, elite level of sports. So um, I, I got tripped in a game and somebody landed on my back and ruptured two discs in my back and tore the sciatic nerve. So that ended my military career. Wow. The two discs. Oh, my goodness. Well, when you were discharged from the Marine Corps, uh, then you were able to recover somewhat and uh, you got a job as a design engineer and things went along and about 10 years later then you got into a car accident and so tell us about your experience that you had with the um, veterans hospital um, well the car accident was a kind of a catalyst for decay as you might say when you when you're physically active for a long time and then all of a sudden you have a debilitating accident that's temporary that stagnation kind of caused a, that perpetuated the need to have the surgery in the first place so in that accident i broke a leg broke my wrist and i was in temporarily in a wheelchair and i only missed two days of work but i made it back to work and and then just a steady deterioration process from not being able to be physically active so i went in the hospital for the um, surgery on my back and um, that was to repair a disc or yeah it was going to be to um fused two levels of my spine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what happened? Well, uh, the, initially I was supposed to have the surgery outside, but because the accident happened on duty in the military, my insurance company denied me, so I had to go to the VA. Sure. And so at the VA, during the first surgery, they took out the wrong disc. <gasps> and um, then they put the bone grafts <sighs> in wrong, and they drilled a hole in my spinal cord during the surgery. <sighs> so it was just one... Kind of this was a long uh, process over how much of time? Uh, it was, I was in, I was supposed to be out of the, the hospital like within three weeks, back to my job and working and walking and surfing. And um, I was in the hospital for three months. And when three I, months? Yeah. Three months. And, then, and then after your hospital stay, things didn't get any better. You, you had uh, all kinds, you didn't get the care that you needed, you didn't get the equipment that you needed, you had some more mishaps. Um, your life was just kind of spiraling downwards. And then something happened. We'd like to know the moment when you decided to take charge of your life and you wanted to just change things. So what did that feel like? What, what turned you around where you decided to take charge? Well, there were a few things. I mean, the, the chief of spinal cord injury told me my physical condition was a waste of human life. And um, that pissed me off. Yes. And, yes. and it just kind of, uh, you know, well, I was angry, but what do I do with it? 
-hmm. you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I just decided to start getting active with the disabled American veterans. And I went on a convention trip up to Fremont and took another little trip. It was my first time traveling in a wheelchair. And I was at the BART station and my front wheel got caught and I got thrown headfirst into the train tracks and I thought I broke my neck. Mm. And then I thought, I'm not being appreciative of the life that I have as a paraplegic because I have so much more to lose. And a combination of those things happening at the same time. All at the same time. Yeah. Pretty much all at the same time. And then um, looking for something to do, finding out about the veterans wheelchair games, just sitting around with, with my buddies at the VA because that's what we do. We, you know, we, the camarader camaraderie at the veterans hospital was like, we all motivate each other. So they said, go to the veterans wheelchair games. You have to go to the Veterans Wheelchair Games. So I went to the Veterans Wheelchair Games, and once I got a taste of competition and sports what, again, you, that you was it. You have some medals. We've got a lot of medals here, and I wouldn't know which, um, anything from this first one that you want to um, show. Well, the fir first I played wheelchair basketball for a decade, and yeah. there weren't really any medals in that. Okay. And then I took up rowing, Yeah. and this is a decade of, a decade of rowing. <laughs> Um, world championship medals, four of them, and a silver, um, all world championship medals. I didn't medal in Beijing, but I made the Paralympics um, in Beijing in rowing. That was my first Paralympics. So. so this is when you said you want to do something positive. I bet it felt really good, right? felt really good just getting into this and having something positive happen in your life instead of the negative. Did that help with your negative portion? Did, you, did this kind of turn, you know, it made you feel good, right? So did it help with that to just make you on a positive level? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. you're setting goals, you're reaching goals. Mm -hmm. um, pretty soon when you're setting positive goals, you forget about the negative things that weigh you down mm -hmm. and the anger. There's no mm -hmm. room for it, no place for it. It just holds you back. So there's yeah. nowhere to go but positively forward. Mm -hmm. So then a little while later, you found out about adaptive rowing. And that led on a whole new direction there with adaptive rowing. Now, you're a coach, and you also um, are the founder of the California Adaptive Rowing Program. So tell us about that program and just that experience. <laughs> well, adaptive rowing is so awesome. It's mm -hmm. all-inclusive, anywhere from traumatic brain injury and autism to severe spinal cord can row. Mm -hmm. It crosses all of the disabilities and abilities, and everyone can do it, which is one thing I like about it. You don't have to be in a wheelchair. Plus, it, the rehabilitative benefits of rowing are amazing. So you don't have to be competitive and in sport. So I was driving all the way to Dana Point to practice when I have a rowing center, a perfectly good place to row five minutes from my house. Ah. So ah. I went in there to the rowing center, and I said, look, I yeah. want to come here and row. What do I need to do? And then... If I'm going to have my boat there, or I figured I might as well start a program. So that's what I did, and we've been there in like 22 years. But now. what does your program do? I, I know you help kids and introduce them to it. So tell us what, what the program does. Um, we have boats and uh, coaching, and we provide an opportunity for, for people to get on the water and learn how to row and row three days a week. Uh, we try to get it often enough that it, they, there's rehabilitative benefits from it. Um, you can go to a, a hospital for physical therapy, or you can go row and get all kinds of therapy. It's <laughs> so beneficial. So, um, you know, I, I just started this program, and it just grew, got more boats and then more people. Um, you know, now we have uh, Blind Center. They come out and row from our VA. The SCI group rows one day. I have a group of women combat vets that row on another day. Oh. Um, PTSD, I mean, it just runs the gamut. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. Would you say that you have more children, young adults, um, veterans? What do you have more? Is it about equal between children and adults? Probably more adults, right? Uh, it all depends. Uh, mm. Sometimes once we get one or two um, autistic families, uh -huh. they're usually homeschooled and then you get a wave. Mm. So, I mean, at one time we had about 30 autistic kids mm -hmm. and then a base of uh, spinal cord injury rowers. There's three classifications. One group that can still use their legs and slide, which are um, amputees and visually impaired. And then there's trunk and arms rowing, which is my class. I can still use my core. 
And then there's just arms and shoulders, which is the severely mm. sick. But autistic fits in the sliding seat rowing. Well, I know we did a show uh, with horses, about horses and autistic children, and they just really adapted very well to that and just uh, did an awful lot for them. I really enjoyed that show and finding out what some of these type of activities can do for children in that regard. And so, of course, adults as well. Um, so from there, you, you had this desire to compete on an international level. And that had to be a dream come true for you. Your first event was in Spain in 2002. What did that feel like? And we got to see some medals too. So what was that like? Well, it, it was amazing. I mean, we, I was with the committee to put Paralympic rowing on the map as far as it was inclusionary. It had never been included in the Paralympics until we as a committee got the amount of countries that we needed, which is like 23 to become a Paralympic sport. And you have to have competed in so many world championships. So in Beijing, it was like, um, I mean, I was voted most likely to become an Olympic athlete in high school before the wheelchair. Wow. So to actually transcend into <laughs> Paralympic sport yeah. was like amazing to make that jump and keep on that same journey. Yes. But just yes. on a parallel kind of level. Yeah. Well, you did it, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> you did yeah. it. <laughs> Paralympians are Olympians. That's <laughs> I can right. Tell you by the work and the dedication and the money and the time you spend reaching that goal, yeah. But I would imagine, you know, now you're traveling and all of this and, and Spain. I've never been to Spain. I've been to Italy, but I've never been to Spain. Uh, that had to be very, very exciting for you to just start that. But, of course, you know, that wasn't enough for you. You know, you, you did that and then you wanted to move on. And so why not row 2,500 miles across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in December? And with a Frenchman, so the little bit of like, nothing could go wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stuff could go wrong. But yeah, I mean, uh, adaptive rowing has a volunteer named Tori Murden, and she was the first woman to row across the Atlantic Ocean. And when I met her and followed her on her journeys, that's when I started having the, the itch to go row across an ocean. <sighs> and the more I talked about it, the more people, uh, once again, it goes back to people telling me I can't. There's a relying theme in my life with people telling me I can't do something. Um, so then obviously, of course, I want to do it. So I start taking my little boat and rowing to Catalina and rowing from Long Beach to San Diego. And, and um, you know, the next thing I know, I've got people in adaptive rowing who are watching the Amputee Coalition of America in that magazine. And they saw an ad by Joe Le Guin, who's a multilingual Frenchman, looking for a male amputee. Mm -hmm. to row across an ocean. And didn't I responded quite, to the ad. <laughs> didn't quite fit that one. <laughs> they said, you are crazy enough to do this. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. But wait a minute. Now, the language. You had a little tad problem with the language there. And then, of course, how long uh, was this? Uh, we're talking about um, how many days did it take? Months? What are, what are we talking about here to row 2,500 miles across the Atlantic Ocean? You know, for two people, it took Frank and I 67 days. <sighs> One person takes, wow. solo takes about 100. Wow. So, <laughs> I don't know what to ask you here. I mean, you went through, I know, a lot of hardships. And, you know, we're just touching on the surface. When people read this book and find out the sores and, and so many things, uh, the, the equipment, uh, things falling apart and not working and all this and that. Um, are you still friends? <laughs> oh, absolutely. That was, that was my best row. That was my favorite row. Um, Frank and I still talk to each other. He wants to do another row with me, but I'm really set on doing a solo row. But where does he want to go? Just an, uh, where? Anywhere. Anywhere. He, once you get hooked on ocean rowing, it's really hard to kick the habit. It's almost addictive if you're the right kind of person. I would say there's a lot of one and dones, middle life, middle life crisis people that mm. just want to go do something different, just mm. do it once and say, oh, no, never again. Uh, right. There's a lot of those. 
<laughs> wow. Well, you saw so many reading about. I, I like wildlife, and so I enjoyed reading about that. And then you also just touched on the sunsets and, and the night sky, which, of course, we don't have any pictures because it's nighttime. You, you're kind of busy, you know, <laughs> yeah. what you're doing. But what would you say that you experience that your average person wouldn't get to see? That you, something just like really like, whoa, that you saw? Uh, the enormity of the ocean, uh, the power of storms, 360-degree uh, lightning across the sky if you're in the center of it and you see oh. it wrap around. And the noise, the thunder. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. There's, oh. there's a lot of noise, ocean rowing. It's like, oh. probably lose part of my hearing with the 20-knot winds whistling all the time. Yes. That's yes. why it doesn't really matter if the person you're with speaks French because you're not going to talk anyway. <laughs> not really. You're not going to hear what they say. Well, we have some photos, and I think that would be a good time to, to look at some of these photos. Uh, they're just kind of an assortment, and you can just kind of fill us in, coaches, what we're looking at as we go. So let's okay. see the pictures. Great. First one here is the Tower Bridge. Yeah, London Tower Bridge. Um, besides crossing oceans, I also circumnavigated Great Britain and the UK. Uh, so we rode from London Tower Bridge to London Tower Bridge without touching land or having a support boat. Took 51 days. That's an awesome picture. <laughs> so next, we have next. Uh, this one was the Atlantic Ocean the second time on Big Blue. I skippered a Kura 16 on the very first ocean run catamaran. Mm. Uh, next. Beautiful. Um, I got back into the lineup surfing. Obviously, I was stationed here from Ohio. First thing I did was take up surfing, and then I spent two years after my back injury and um, thought I'd never surf again, but there I go. Wow. Next. That's, that's pretty big surf there. <laughs> this is a storm at night with Frank on the boat in the survival suit. Um, Obviously, he's an amputee, so he, he just folded up like the leg. He looks like he's struggling there quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the boat's constantly moving, and it's kind of hard to keep your balance anyway. And when you don't have a leg, it's, it's <laughs> people used to joke that we only had one good leg between us because mine don't work, and then he only has one. So next. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this is Frank and I rowing, training row on the coast of France. A training, so you're training your own. Yeah. Way. You did a lot of that? <laughs> yeah, we, I did. I spent time in France immersed um, mm. in the language. I never learned much of it because uh -huh. it's really hard to speak. But, um, yeah, we'd go there and stay with his family, and Frank and I would train Aww. on the Metz River. That's neat. Next. Next. Oh, pretty. This is at night. Um, we light up the flares when we come in at night on the ocean rowing boats because you never know when, if it's going to be daytime or nighttime when you actually row into port. So um, we use the flares, um, one to guide us, and then so the people on land can see us come in, and the other is is as a form of celebration uh. when you get to the other side of an ocean row. Next, flying fish. Oh, what fish. is that? That is oh, <laughs> flying fish. See the little okay. wings on there. At night, you mentioned at night, but sometimes you can't. It's so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face, and. Uh, you know, the waves are crashing you uh, down yeah. on your boat, knocking you down, but you're also getting pelted with flying fish. It's like they'll smack you in the head, and then you'll hear. <laughs> Be because you're low to the water. You're absolutely, that makes sense. And there'll be hundreds of them just flying out of the water, and they get in, you know, they flop around on your boat, and the next day you have to kind of... Well, we've all, you know, seen Sully and, and the birds getting the airplanes, but, you know, you got the fish that hit the boats. <laughs> and your head, and your body, and everything else. And, this is my family. This is my dad and, and Betty, and uh, we shipped the boat to Miami and drove up there. And I hired my grand, grandkids, my granddaughters, to clean it out. I paid them five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> they kept asking for more money because <laughs> after an ocean row, there's a lot of things that are pretty naff on a boat. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. They got, you know, coming home and seeing your family after 67 days at sea and one of these droves, you know, oh, tongue-tied. And this one? Getting emotional. Um, this one is, I brought the boat back to California, and this is one of our California adaptive rowers uh, getting to actually try rowing in the ocean rowing boat. So as soon as I brought the boat back home, I started taking people out in it just for fun. And uh, so, yeah, that's one of our adaptive rowers. Oh, wow. Very nice. Well, this is just uh, 
That is just a portion of the pictures that you have. You have so many more, and they're all very, very interesting. But the bottom line of this race is 2007, thank you, um, you became the first disabled woman to row across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that would be probably enough for most people, but not you. <laughs> so after this race, tell us the other adventures that you've had. Amazing. <laughs> after, the row, after the row with Frank, it's like the other crews and teams were going like, well, how did they row such a straight course? And it's like, and they looked at Frank and I and they saw what I did. And then I got invited to skipper a crew of eight across the Indian Ocean. I mean, when my ability to navigate and then um, that, and then the Guinness World Record, obviously the first woman to row across. Wow. Not just the first disabled woman, the first woman. Yeah. So I got to be part of this crew. And um, so, so you're in the Guinness, not once, but more than once. I think I have about nine total now. <laughs> But, yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Right. So the Indian Ocean, uh, all these opportunities have come up after saying, you know, after that one, it's like I got asked to skipper this boat. Then I got asked to skipper um, the crew of 16 across the Atlantic Ocean again. I got asked to be part of the four women crew circ circumnavigating Great Britain. All this time I still wanted, I wanted to do a solo row. So you went Tower Bridge to where? Tower Bridge. So around? All of the UK between Ireland and England and all the way up around Scotland and back down. and That's amazing. We have a map, but oh well. <laughs> that one goes a circle. <laughs> so that, that is something else that you did. Um, and then, let's see, you wanted to, uh, where the book ends, I guess that's where I'm at, where the book ends is where you wanted to do a solo uh, mm -hmm. across the Pacific Ocean from Santa Cruz to Hawaii. So that's when the book ends, but now you tell me that it's already been done. You already did this. Tell us about that. I did after. I'm <laughs> sorry. I should have told you. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I attempted to row solo from Santa Cruz, and I, you know, the, I spent seven days, made 172 miles, got, just got totally beat up. I was in gale force four winds, and I had to call it off and get rescued. So, um, Wait, is this when you lost your boat? Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. You which, lost is, which is in the book. Which, yeah, which right. showed when up. I got ran over by the container ship <laughs> that was supposed to pick me up. But, and then the boat left adrift and then um, fishing boat, Fourth of July weekend. And it was a tribute row to honor the fallen. So fishing boat, Fourth of July weekend, named the Old Glory, found it 80 miles west of uh, San Diego. And they gave it to me. They said, hey, you know, we love your cause. We love what you're doing. We're going to give this boat back to you, and you know it's not going to cost you. Normally, anything, you'd have to pay. Yes, but maritime laws, salvage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they gave it back to me, and then I I knew that I had set a goal to make the 2016 team for Rio, so I only had a limited amount of time to try to get to Hawaii. So I invited a rowing partner, Tara Remington from New Zealand, to do the row with me, so I would do it as two. So we left May 20th, uh, 2014, and rowed past the Diamond Head Lighthouse buoy on July 19th, uh -huh. on 2014. So 2014, I became the first disabled woman to row to Hawaii also, and the <sighs> first women's pair, and at that time it was the fastest women's pair. Okay, so now we came kind of to the end of the book, but I, I know that's not the end of your adventures. So now you were telling me before the show started that you're going to go again in 27, tell us. What are you doing? Uh, next year. <laughs> yeah. Next year, I, uh, you know. 2018. The, the solo row is still on my bucket list. Okay. Remains to be done because I got okay. rescued. So uh, I'm going to do a repeat. I'm going to try again. You're going to try again. Next year. And how far are you going with that now? Are you, I All don't know what you. <laughs> well, you got your boat. Yes. Which probably needs to be repaired. Yes, it does. You know, all of what goes, I mean, we, we didn't talk about that. A lot of it's in the book. But, I mean, we didn't talk about what goes on with repairing the boat, getting everything. And then the communication, we get some, well, in this case, is solo. So you don't have to, do you, you've got people that are following you, though. No. Um, no. No. I have a satellite <laughs> telephone and a tracking beacon um, people can follow online. We call them dot watchers. <laughs> Every day at a certain time, you can see how many miles I've gone dit, 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 across the ocean. Oh. And then you can follow a blog. Oh, the blog. Okay, so right. people go to the website and they can follow your blog. That's terribly right. exciting. So that's coming up. Um, do you have a definite it'll date? It'll be next year. It'll be um, 
I'll be taking off somewhere. I'm looking March through June as far as a takeoff. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's going to take, take about 100 days. 100 days. So normally we leave, or like I left in June and May, but I know it's going to take 100 days, and I got almost hit by a, you know, a hurricane the last time. So I think maybe March, April to leave <laughs> this time. <laughs> I could tell so. you about Hawaii. I remember we traveled uh, in October, and I was told afterwards, oh, didn't you know that was the hurricane? We did happen to hit a hurricane, but um, I, Iwa, I think it was, that was a while ago, but I had no idea that that was the hurricane season. So We try to avoid those. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> In our planning. Idea. Well, we have a couple minutes left, and I'd like to know what else you'd like to talk about, because I know that there's so much to tell people what they'd like to, or what you'd like to have them know. So I'm just giving you a couple minutes here to say what you'd like people to know. Okay. You know? Well, you know, the first thing, and uh, I guess my mantra is to, to never give up, to always keep trying to reach your goals, to not be afraid to set um, higher goals for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. we're so quick to give up or to say the word can't. And, mm -hmm. you know, once earlier you used the word yet, and I use the word yet at all. You know, it's like a, in those instances where, oh, I can't wear a cross notion yet. It's like adds a whole new, keeps it open in your mind. Mm, mm. It, something isn't achievable if you've decided it's not achievable. Mm -hmm. And words in your mind can play big tricks on you. Mm. So if you always keep your mind open, um, you know, it's like yeah. rowing is like when you get blown off course, it's just like in life when the rug gets pulled out from under you. You know, you plot a new course to where you want to go and you take yourself from where you find yourself to where you want to go. And we decide that we're not powerless. That's our choice. So it's like choosing to move from one spot to another, choosing your goal and moving positively forward to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. That's within us all. Yeah. Um, remaining adrift is also our choice. Yes. So better to move on. Your, your knees and everything are okay now because the book ends with you possible might have to have some surgeries on your knees. Is all that behind of us? No oh, no. More. No. Oh, so you're going to have to do that before? That's what this year's for. Oh, I see. I'm so in the you middle still of... have to do something, little repair work yes. there. Yes. Plus, I've torn my shoulder throwing shot put. So. Ah. Well, I just want to say I know that you can handle whatever you're doing. I want you to know that on behalf of everybody here in the studio and the TV audience, we salute and congratulate your many successes, <laughs> and we wish you all the best for your future successes. Thank you. And I'd like to tell people out there to um, just be inspired. Look at the website, see the videos and the pictures, and just think about the show and what she said. It's just mind-boggling. So thank you for watching the show and watch again. And would you mind uh, signing my book? Sure. Thank you. That was an LA 2024 pin that I gave you oh. for the bid to host the Olympics in LA. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll put this on if I can. I will put this on now. <laughs> uh, or not. It's tough, isn't it? <laughs> I don't want to use my teeth, but I'll put it on later. It's really, really nice. Thank you. Are you going to be writing another book? Uh, I have certainly have enough material, and I've yes, you do. already started. So. Yes. Same publisher? You'll stay with the same Hellgate publisher? Hellgate Press pu publishes military books, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, they do. I checked them out. They're pretty cool.